มโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนามสามีนเมื่อ practicing the Dhamma we have to develop all the uh, good skillful qualities of our mind to match and ultimately overcome all the unskillful ignorant qualities of our mind And so we have to constantly remind ourselves what we're doing and why. Even though sometimes it can be the repetitive nature of the you know, listening to the Dhamma, talking about the Dhamma, can at first seem boring or off-putting. I think for most people, it is a necessary part of the practice just to keep coming back to the reasons why we practice, how we practice, what qualities we're developing, what qualities we have to be letting go of and abandoning. We have to accept there is a lot of repetition because we're working with our, particularly with our mind. But also our speech, our actions that have been conditioned for years and years since we were born, and because we're still caught into stress and suffering, and we probably already have a glimpse of insight that we are still stuck in a lot of negative habits. And to uh, unpick and unravel some of those habits, it's going to take a lot of practice, training. Just as the the negative qualities have been doing their thing for many many years, having the freedom to run around our mind and lead us in all kinds of Directions, the way we think, the moods we fall into, and then expressions of that through our speech, our actions. Well, now we have to do the opposite, and we have to bring up the wholesome, more skillful qualities of the Eightfold Path, Sila Samadhi Panya, and all the Dhammas, and Dhamma teachings, to balance and then get the better of. These more negative, unwholesome habits that we're so used to. So we have to keep reminding ourselves of the Dhamma, keep listening to teachings, keep telling ourselves. You know, part of our practice is having this skillful conversation with ourselves, even when we are suffering or caught into moods, even when you're in moods of despair. <laughs> Disappointment, anger, all forms of uh, mental stress and suffering. We just have no op option really but to keep coming back and reminding ourselves what we need to do until it sticks, sticks in the mind more and more. Yeah, you know, this practice is a is a gradual training, <coughs> a learning process. Observation process of observation and understanding where suffering comes from, what to do about it, and to keep applying the practice over and over again. Whether you uh, look at the Buddha's life and practice, or the practice of all the enlightened wise beings since the time of the Buddha up to the t present day. Or we just look around in the world, you know, 
people who have achieved different kinds of success in the world. And nothing happens just overnight, just like that. Even though we tend to build up, make a lot of the sort of the final moment of realization, you know, the moment the person reached enlightenment, or the Buddha reached enlightenment, or the moment the person had the breakthrough and got their theory that changed the world, <laughs> made, their, made, made its impression on them or the world around them. You know, that was just the, the final moment of a process that may have involved many, many hours, weeks, months, years of hard effort and practice and whether we're talking about the practice of Buddhism or just generally in the world, you know, nothing happens just like that. If you're going to be successful in what you're setting out to do, you have to keep keep at it. Keep building with experience on what you're doing. So the practice of what the Buddha taught is really a, a training. A training of a human being. This human being each one of us for our own good and for the good of the world and so often people misunderstand and because of their lack of experience lack of knowledge of buddhism and the buddhist path they, they keep saying well this what the buddha taught is all all sounds very good but really it's very self-indulgent just teaching people to go off on their own and meditate be with themselves, you know, not do anything for the rest of the world, or even other people that they know, their family and friends, but just a very self-centered, self-indulgent path. What's the point of it? But the Buddha in his wisdom pointed out that well, it's very difficult to help other people successfully and well, especially uh, over time, without helping ourselves first and learning how to help ourselves. It's very difficult to help others if you don't really know your own mind and know yourself. If you don't know how to take responsibility for your own thoughts, speech, actions. The unenlightened mind is quite used to going out and thinking about the world. It's not to say that all those thoughts are bad or wrong. It can be quite useful as well. We we learn many things in the, you know, the history of humanity, society, what we call civilization has developed in so many ways. Just the thinking mind, the knowledge of human beings, it's, it's not all pointless, meaningless. But the Buddha emphasized the fact that if we don't also develop our own inner knowledge and understanding, all this external knowledge that's helped the world is, still doesn't really help us get very far as human beings, doesn't help us, fully help us out of suffering. Can, we can alleviate certainly a lot of our material, physical suffering and the material problems of the world. But the problems of the heart, what you might call spiritual problems, the heart problems of human beings, are not necessarily being addressed. So this is why the Buddha encouraged us to develop our hearts, our spiritual heart or mind, through this practice. Because it was a, it's a matter of emphasis. He's bringing us back to what he realized and saw is important for human beings and that is often neglected. It's very difficult to help others effectively if we haven't understood ourselves and brought ourselves to <clears throat> knowledge and realization first. When I was a young monk, in the training in the tradition of Ajahn Chah, I was always taught not to spend too much time going out talking to people or teaching other people when I first began. The emphasis was all on about teaching yourself. 
And that was quite a normal thing to hear in the monasteries that I lived with. Us. What Panana Chan, what Nomba Pong where Ajahn Chah lived, or later what Mahap Chan where Ajahn Anand lives. I was always being to told to go on meditate, <laughs> go on practice. We actually have rules. One of the rules of what Bapong set up by Ajahn Chah was you know, not to spend time in unnecessary chatter or socializing when doing group activities. We had a rule, you, know, you don't speak when you wash your bowl, your arms bowl after the meal. You go into the forest and you wash it. But you don't speak, you do it mindfully. When you're drying your bowl, you sit down and find a place in the sun to dry your bowl. You know, the tendency is, having eaten a, your one meal of the day, to be energized to talk. So you have to work hard not to talk very much. And that was the flavor of the practice when I was first training in the monastery. We were encouraged not to talk too much, but to watch our minds and learn from our own minds, to train ourselves. That was the emphasis, because if we didn't, train ourselves, then if we were going to go out and help the world or teach other people, what is it that we, we, we would be passing on to others? That was the question that was asked of us. You know, would we just be passing on our own confusion, misunderstanding, lack of peace, or our own desires? You know, desire, even in Buddhism, you know, the desire to be a teacher or to be a a Buddhist personality, somebody who's well known, doing good for others in one way or another. Is that what we would be passing on or would we practice first and get to the point where we've had some real understanding, realization? Of course, that's hard to determine, isn't it? It's hard to determine when someone is realized in the Dhamma. Someone like Ajahn Chah was an exception. Anyone who lived with Ajahn Chah, probably 99.9% .9 of people who lived with Ajahn Chah came in contact with him, had great faith in him as a teacher, and as a realized teacher who did understand what the Buddha had practiced and penetrated the Four Noble Truths freed his mind from greed, anger, delusion, seemed to emanate from him. It wasn't just his words, although they expressed a great depth of wisdom and understanding, but it's also a feeling. Just being around Ajahn Chah, even when he was ill and wasn't speaking, he had an amazing peaceful energy around him. And monks who live with him even at the very end of his life, you know, they all felt that his mind was very clear, peaceful, mindful. So for someone like Ajahn Chah, there wasn't much doubt in people's minds. And you don't know exactly because everyone's realization is their own realization. As we chanted, you know, the wise know for themselves. Pachatang veditabo we knew he. That's just nature, isn't it? You know, you know for yourself where your mind is at, whether it's peaceful or full of suffering, <laughs> that's something you know personally. But living with a teacher who does seem to be realized, you know, is a, there's a great benefit to that because you get confidence that the path does work and this training, however long it's going to take, however difficult it may be, whatever the obstacles may be, it does seem to work because there are those individuals such as Ajahn Chah, that are living proof, or at that time, say for me, they were living proof. But in the beginning, you know, you, the teaching was, don't go out and uh, teach others and make a big impression on the world. The opposite. Go back to your hut in the forest and sit and walk meditation. Find a quiet place and meditate. Be restrained, practice sense restraint, mindfulness and clear comprehension in daily life. Don't get too involved in the world. That was the, that was the instruction. And it seemed to be correct. 
because if you ask anyone who comes to live in a monastery, you know, most of us, when we first arrive, we have too much to say, <laughs> too many things to say, too many views and opinions that we're expressing, and sometimes get into disagreements, even over the Dhamma. You know, people have their view on the Dhamma. What is the highest Dhamma, the lowest Dhamma, the right Dhamma, the wrong Dhamma? Different traditions, different aspects of the Dhamma. Any Buddhist monastery you go to and you, you're around the newest members of the community, it always tends to be like that. Lots of views and opinions and discussion. It's not all wrong, of course, but you know, my memory is you know, I always had too much, too many views and opinions and not enough awareness. And the teaching was, you know, get back to this place of awareness, develop your mindfulness and your ability to reflect on your own experience before you start expressing too many views and opinions. So in a Buddhist monastery you learn to be a bit more humble. Uh, a sense of humour helps. You laugh at yourself at how many views and opinions you can have in one day. Sometimes monks will even you know, keep a running score. How many opinions did I express today <laughs> over the way things should be in the monastery or over the, the enlightenment of the Buddha or some other person or the way the chores should be done or the routine or how long we should meditate for. You know, it can be over anything. And so you, with a sense of humor, sometimes you just keep noticing how often the mind wants to express itself. So you also have to have a lot of patience and forgiveness for yourself when you're beginning practice because you're dealing with an untrained mind and trying to tame, tame it and train it. It certainly isn't going to work just through using willpower and trying to force your mind. You also have to coax your mind. You just like if you've ever had a stray dog or a stray cat come into your life, you, know, you can't just force it from day one. You have to use a lot of love and care and attention and skillful means and gradually your cat or your dog may start to do what it's supposed to do and fall into place and be easy to look after. Not always, but generally they do. And the mind is the same. So it takes a lot of effort, time, patience and developing all these skillful qualities. And if we just rush off you know, to tell everybody else about the Dhamma and how how it should be and how it is, you know, we can easily fall back into our old habits because that's what we were doing in the world before we started practicing the Dhamma. Whether you're a monk or a, a lay practitioner, you, you can probably remember before you ever learnt meditation, you, know, you whatever is on your mind, you'd probably just say it. Every opinion, every thought, every feeling, constantly telling the world <laughs> and getting entangled in the world and maybe sometimes obviously sometimes doing some good in the world as well but often not doing so much good just adding to the general confusion and chaos of the world so coming to the buddhist teachings you're coming to learn about yourself as a human being and you have to have an acceptance that, okay, when the starting point is not always great, we have an accumulated collection of um, characteristics. We have moods, delight and aversion. And uh, we have a lot of knowledge, which is sometimes useful, but sometimes just becomes a tool for harming ourselves and others. And the raw materials that we bring with us to the practice, you know, they require time and attention and effort to deal with and to mould and get into a better place. So we have to remind ourselves of that fact and then keep bringing up the teachings of the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma and then bringing it into our hearts in order to learn. We spend all our time telling everyone else about the Dhamma and how good it is. You know, you can do some good like that, but at the same time you're forgetting yourself, aren't you? So we were encouraged not to do that. I remember when Lumpur Blian, one of the 
great enlightened med- meditation master who used to live in uh, northern Thailand, Chiang Mai. He came to visit Australia many times, and uh, one story he told us was about you know, he he was a meditation master, and he had great powers of samadhi, and he'd used and developed his samadhi to the point where he could recollect his past lives. And not many people can do that, but he could with certainty. And for him, he could talk about his past lives with great conviction and no no doubt and the feeling was yeah he wasn't confused or deluded because he'd practiced for many years and I knew him for many years I didn't think he was a deluded person he seemed very reasonable wise human being but he also had this skill of recollecting past lives and one story he told was that when he was a junior monk in the time of the Buddha he you know, had the great good fortune to be born in the time of the Buddha and live in the Jetavana Monastery, which we all know about from the suttas. It's where the Buddha spent more of his time than any other monastery. In Lumpur Plian, in that uh, period, he was a junior monk and his teacher was Venerable Maha Moggallana. The monk, uh, if you could see the statues behind me, uh, we have two statues standing either side of the Buddha. One is Venerable Sariputta, who was, we say, the wisest disciple of the Buddha, and the other was Venerable Mahamogalana, and he was the foremost in the use of samadhi, training the mind in samadhi and developing psychic powers. So Lumpur Plian was a student of his, which is possibly where you know, he gets... He got all his psychic powers from, or this characteristic, this tendency to develop psychic powers. And he said in that life, he misunderstood the practice a little bit. He had already developed many great skills and qualities, and he was already fairly advanced in his Dhamma practice, but he wasn't fully enlightened. And he said he, he was so inspired by the Buddha and the Dhamma and the teachings of the Buddha, he spent all his time going out telling other people how good the Buddha's teachings were and encouraging them come, to come and listen to the Dhamma. So he said that life he didn't get enlightened because he spent all his time telling other people how good it was uh, but not putting enough effort into his own practice. So this is one of the teachings he gave us when he came here first. He said, you know, it is good to help others and teach others, but we also have to teach ourselves. Otherwise, we're not fully practicing what the Buddha taught. And it may even be easier to tell others about the Dhamma. You know, once we're inspired and we've read a bit and heard a bit, well, we've got knowledge we can pass on. And that can be useful, of course. But how well have we taught ourselves is even perhaps an even harder question to answer. It's, it's enjoyable to talk to others and tell others about the Dhamma. It's harder to teach ourselves because our own mind is so stubborn, so caught up into its own cravings and clingings, sense of self. So teachers like Lumpur Pli and Lumpur Cha you know, always were reminding both Sangha and laity, you know, don't spend too much time talking, discussing the Dhamma. You know, at the appropriate occasion, do discuss the Dhamma, listen to the Dhamma, but then go away and practice. And that's where we're lacking. That's where we need to increase our effort. That's the value of monasteries and Buddhist centers, meditation centers, um, or even in your home, you know, the quiet corner, the quiet room where you meditate, the quiet corner. The value of all these places is that you have somewhere where you can go and be with yourself and learn to practice the Dhamma. Partly it's to recharge, isn't it? If you are engaged helping other people, well, you get tired, you get exhausted doing that. You get physically tired and mentally tired. We need to recharge. So part of the practice is learning to recharge, spending time on our own, developing our meditation quietly for ourselves. But it's not just recharging, it's also for developing deeper insight. 
because if we don't have that time and don't give ourselves that time, we, will, we can't really see and understand what the Buddha was pointing to. You know, the heart of what the Buddha was pointing to is developing the mind, the qualities of the mind, to know itself, see it itself, and particularly to see where suffering comes from. Where does it come from? Well, the Buddha said, look, and you'll see it comes from not knowing, unawareness or ignorance. And what must be the hardest thing to see and know in the world is what we don't know. <laughs> ignorance, unawareness. Because we're unaware, we don't know that we're unaware. It's the hardest thing to root out. It's the very last thing a human being will abandon before they experience Nibbāna. It's the abandoning of avicca, lack of knowledge or ignorance or unawareness. It's the very last thing to, we give up completely. So it's the hardest thing. But where we tend to see it first is through seeing how this process of craving, stimulated by ignorance, craving, wanting, desiring, gives rise to clinging, what we call a sense of self, and eventually leads to suffering. So it's a process that we can study and learn. And this is where we have to devote this time and energy that we put into the practice to learning about the process where, where suffering arises in this human mind, human heart. And it's very difficult to do it just by teaching or engaging with the world alone. You learn something when you teach or when you help others in different ways and that's good and it's not, not, it's not all bad but if you don't give yourself that time to understand your own mind it's very difficult to penetrate more deeply and to understand this process by which suffering arises, by which this sense of self is created you know, the delusion that this body and mind is a substantial lasting self very difficult to unravel unless we give ourselves that time and put effort into developing mindfulness and awareness. So this is where meditation comes into our practice, why we meditate. We're developing the skill of knowing ourselves. And these days we do talk a lot about the world and the environment and society and how to improve it and not just you know, how to deal with the pandemic, but we've got climate change and all the problems of society. There's a lot of talk and interest about how to improve the world, and that's good. But that's only one side of the story, isn't it? The, the external environment, we have to improve society, health, safety, the environment. But what about the inner environment, the environment of this mind? It's very difficult to improve the world on the outside if we are still caught up in our own suffering. We're full of anger, full of greed, full of despair. That needs to be addressed too, otherwise it'll be, we'll, we won't be able to do much to help the world outside. So where does inner suffering come from? Well, it comes from this process where when we fall into unawareness, ignorance, what happens is we, our mind gets caught up in craving, wanting. We want things, we crave the pleasant things that we can have with our senses and then we get caught into aversion when we don't get what we want or when the things we want end, when we lose them we can't get them again, get them back again. And we crave to be things, to be successful based on a sense of this person, this body, this mind as being a substantial self. Then we crave to get this self into different positions of what we consider success or happiness without ever checking to see if it's true or not. So the Buddha encouraged us to meditate regularly, ask questions, observe the truth, ask questions. You know, the, everything that I'm 
aiming for in life, you know, how true is it, how real is it? You know, getting me, this self, this idea of a self to some point of happiness, success, how true is that? How true are the thoughts, the emotions that lie behind that? How true is the happiness that we keep falling into and craving that we can have through our senses? You know, the pleasant things of this world. How real, how true uh, is it? How true is this self that experiences that happiness? Now the Buddha was only really pointing to what is happening to us as human beings, to just what's going on in nature. Of course he developed a language around it, and so we have these words like craving and attachment and have over the centuries developed Buddhist practice. You know, we have monasteries and Sangha will wear robes and keep rules and lay people keep rules and they meditate and they chant and they listen to Dhamma and we have rituals. Of course we have all that which can be very useful for um, providing a structure for the religion, for passing on the teachings. But when we start to meditate, we're actually setting all that aside and we're just looking to the, the very center of our experience, this, the human heart or mind, and seeing, well, what is suffering and stress? Well, it's this clinging to a sense of self in this body, in our thoughts, in our feelings, in the ideas and concepts we have, we cling to them with a sense of self. And because it is a delusion, deep down, you know, it, what the Buddha already has pointed out, is because it's an illusion, we start to suffer because we can't hold on to what we're clinging to as a self. It doesn't last. It's constantly changing, and ultimately we can't control or make it the way the deluded mind would like. And unless we start addressing that, looking more closely at that, will we keep suffering? So as we develop the mind through meditation, we're looking back at, at, the, at the mind, developing the quality of the mirror, you know, the, mir mind, the mirror of the mind, this quality of polishing the mirror, polishing the glass of the window so that we can see more clearly what's going on. And we start maybe noticing that you know, one thing leads to another. When I attach to every thought, every desire, it doesn't lead to a peaceful state of clarity and understanding. It tends to lead to more clinging, more suffering. You know, even the tiniest desire, when we cling to it with unawareness, it's agitating to the mind. And you see that when you meditate. You, know, you sit down to meditate with the breathing and straight away your mind wants to do something else. <laughs> it wants to talk to someone or go somewhere or have something or eat something or watch something or find out about something or do something. People say that sometimes, you know, they come into the monastery and they say, I can't sit still, I feel like I've got to do something. <laughs> what is that? That's the whole purpose of the practice, is to look at that mind that's saying, I've got to do something. And sometimes we dress it up, you know, the mind and the mind of ignorance, craving and clinging, you know, it can be quite clever as well. So it'll dress it up and say, well, I need to do this thing because it's important. You know, there's some important job I've got to do, some important person I've got to see, something I've got to do. We've always got to do something. Even when we feel tired, we say, I've got to rest. I've got to stop doing what I'm doing now and do something different. I've got to lie down and rest. Or when we've rested too much, we, I've got to get up and do something. <laughs> it's never ending, isn't it? That's the nature of craving and clinging. It's a never ending restlessness and agitation of mind, sometimes dressed up with very good reasons. But when you're looking deeper, you're seeing the very disturbing nature of craving and clinging. Sometimes it's just basic, I want something pleasant, feel better, 
I want to get away from my pain and my discomfort. Sometimes it's very basic, sometimes it's much more subtle, you know, clinging to views and opinions and beliefs. My view of the world, how the world should be, what I think, what I believe in. We take comfort, we take refuge in our beliefs and views as well. And that stimulates more craving and clinging. So we keep taking a particular belief or viewpoint on something and as long as we have it, we sort of feel good with it, agree with it, accept it into our mind and we, we cling to it. But then there's, of course, a danger there that you cling to a view. If it's a clinging from a place of self, a place of ignorance, then that clinging can lead to more suffering. So you, sometimes it leads to conflict with others who have a different view, a different belief. Sometimes this disappointment within ourselves when we cling to something and later we realize that what we clung to is wrong or incorrect, confusing. So the Buddha was encouraging us to develop this ability to bring our attention to the present moment, still the mind so that we are exposing craving and clinging that brings, develops this sense of self, the delusion of self, to expose it and reveal it as incorrect, not the way out of suffering, to peace, to, to a, a better state of mind you could say, but actually to more craving, more clinging. What does craving produce as a result? It produces more craving, more dissatisfaction, discontent, more suffering. It doesn't lead to less suffering. I mean, that in itself is enough if you can recognize the, the agitation of craving and wanting and see it what it is. Well, that's enough to say this is leading to suffering I don't want to follow anymore. But much of our accumulated craving and clinging, you know, it's coming after many, many years, maybe lifetimes of craving and clinging. So it has a certain energy to it, strength to it. So it takes some patient effort and observation to realize that craving is the source of suffering. So often it's telling us, no, no, I'm not a source of suffering. You follow me and it's, I'm gonna lead you to happiness. So yeah, when you, maybe you're not that hungry, but you see some attractive and tasty looking food, taste or nice smelling food, you, know, you, you go for it because of craving and you can use reasoning and say, well, I need food to live as a human, you know, we need to eat, we need to drink, it all sounds good. But it's craving maybe dressed up with some, some logic, some reasoning. Uh, or how often, you know, when, how often does, does craving sneak into our life, like say with a person, if it's say or your family member, you know, they do something not very good, they hurt you or they hurt someone else or they hurt themselves through their unskillful behavior. But because they're a family member, we say, oh, I'll forgive them. You know, we get angry, we get afraid or upset by what they've done, disappointed but we'll let it go, we'll let it be, the craving comes up but we let it be because it's our loved one, our friend or our family member. But if it's a stranger, no, 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 <laughs> the craving is going to take over and become, we become very angry and maybe uh, seek revenge or seek some kind of retribution on the person. Craving is like this, you know, there's, there's very simple, easy craving to identify and let go of but then craving is affected by our clinging and our deeper attachments. And sometimes it's very difficult to let go of, difficult to see. But craving leads to suffering because craving supports clinging, clinging creates a sense of self. Four kinds of clinging the Buddha talked about is clinging just for sense objects and the sensory experience we have. So we see things and the sense of self arises, we hear things, sense of self arises because of clinging. So I see, I hear, and then of course if you see something good, you like it, see something bad, you don't like it, and so on. So just sense, sense desire and our senses are a form of clinging, sense of self arises. Clinging to views, opinions, beliefs, beliefs about the practice of Dhamma, beliefs about politics and the world, the way things should be done, what's right and wrong, 
So, you know, all kinds of views, opinions, beliefs about things, but it's just the, the blind or ignorant attachment and clinging to them is part of this sense of self, fueled by craving. Clinging to, um, we say, rites and rituals or external practices. So that even, even the good practices we do, if we just cling to them without awareness and understanding, they just become habitual or perfunctory practices. So even something like meditation, you can cling to it as a, you do your meditation, I've done my half an hour, I've done my bit for the day, I've done some good, but maybe the actual practice of meditation, we weren't developing much awareness, we're just doing it more in a habitual way, fulfilling a function, fulfilling a need, even a form of craving, you could say. Um, Maybe we do it because others do it and we're just following along. So this is what we call clinging to rites, rituals, practices. And then clinging to the idea of self, the concept of self. Interpreting everything as me, mine, myself. These are what we call the four kinds of clinging. And this is a process, isn't it? You have ignorance, gives rise to craving, gives rise to clinging, gives rise to suffering, which conditions more ignorance. So it's a circular process. It's what we call paticca samubhada, dependent origination. You know, things arise dependent on causes and conditions. Our experience of suffering arises because of causes and conditions. And because we suffer and we cling to a sense of self, so we suffer with, and the sense of self says, I am suffering, we condition more ignorance. So it's this cycle that's going on every moment of every day. It's also used in the Buddhist teachings to explain rebirth, birth and rebirth, or birth, death and rebirth. And because of craving, clinging, you get birth, which leads to more craving, clinging and birth, and then death and then more birth. But really this birth and death is going on every moment of every day. And what are you doing in meditation? You're observing the birth and death of mental states. Mental states of craving and clinging arise. And if left unaddressed, you leave them alone, then they start to cause you more suffering, don't they? More stress, more dissatisfaction, discontent. They don't lead to stillness, clarity, brightness or radiance, they don't lead to realization, they lead to suffering if left unaddressed, if we don't practice. But as you start to practice, you're noticing this process at work. You know, oh, another bit of craving, another wanting and desire, an unfulfilled desire bothering me, another bit of aversion, some unpleasant thing I don't like, get, want to get rid of that. Constantly feeding into this sense of self, attaching to, or we say, identifying with this body, mind, thoughts, feelings as self. And the whole time the process is hardening, getting more solid. So we have this sense, if, if we never investigate, we never look, we have this sense of me being a solid self. And you know, on a superficial level, you can back it up. There's this body here, this is me. I feel, I can feel pleasure and pain. There's a me there who feels my pleasure, my pain, my thoughts, I think, therefore I am. You know, on a superficial, the appearance of things is, yes, there's a self here and it's all backed up by um, evidence. And then you, know, you talk to someone else and say, yeah, they exist, they're, they're there as well. They're, they're a self, so there's me, there's you. On the you know, the appearance of things is, yes, there's a self. So all this craving and clinging seems correct. But this is why we need to develop meditation, have some quiet time to ourselves to look closely and say, well, actually, craving and clinging is just a habit coming from ignorance. What happens when we start to let go of craving and clinging? Develop more mindfulness, see the impermanence, nature of craving and clinging, seeing the conditioned nature of craving and clinging, what happens? Ah, oh, the mind starts to go a bit more quiet, doesn't it? 
we feel better. When you let go of craving, you feel a little bit better. If you let go of craving over and over again, which you are doing in meditation, you feel better over and over again. You may, may get to a point where all your craving goes quiet for a while. You know, the temporary stilling of the mind is what we call samadhi, where all the craving, the liking and disliking, the confusion, the agitation, the desire, the restlessness, the sleepiness, the worry, all goes quiet. And the mind absorbs into a meditation object, such as the breath. When that happens, you get a whole new perspective on craving, clinging in the sense of self. You say, where is this sense of self? If craving and clinging goes quiet, for, even if only for five minutes, the sense of self has gone quiet for five minutes. And there's a whole new realization there, isn't it? It may not yet be Nibbana, but it's, it's a temporary realization of Nibbana, you could say. It's like, oh, all that stuff, you know, the mind that wants to do something, get something done, get rid of something, it's gone. That is one of the main purposes of samadhi, is have the realization that the mind can go still, can go quiet temporarily, albeit. And then you can look back at your normal experience. Having experienced the quiet stillness of mind, you use that as a platform for looking back at all the movement of the mind. You see all this craving and clinging, the doing, the wanting, the being, the trying to do this, trying to get that. Oh, there's a lot of suffering. It's very tiring, mentally tiring, physically tiring sometimes, and also leads to a lot of conflict in ourselves and then leads to conflict with other people. So this is learning about the inner environment of the world, cleaning up the inner environment, the junk, the pollution, the Buddha even used the word pollution in asavas, the mental pollutants of the mind, your know, craving, clinging, attachment to views, attachment to self. This is the pollution of the mind. But just like real pollution, you know, in the ocean, you, know, you have to investigate before you find it. You know, recently they've been doing a lot of investigation of the ocean and they find a lot of different kinds of chemicals in it, plastics, all kinds of pollutants that normally the eye doesn't see, does it? It's under the surface. Occasionally you get the beaches that are completely covered in rubbish, but there's a lot of pollution under the surface. And now through technology and just over time people are finding it. We also have to do the same with the ocean of the mind. You go into the ocean of the mind and start recognizing some of this mental pollution, this greed, anger, delusion, sense of self, craving, clinging. That's what we're looking at and we're seeing how it's arisen over time. It's a process by which we fall into the habits of ignorance, conditioning, craving, conditioning, clinging, conditioning, a sense of self, birth and death, the suffering of the mind. So when we experience some stillness and mindfulness, the mind can question that process, interrupt the process and question it, investigate it and look more closely, examine it more closely. And you realize, hmm, this thing I was, the, that appeared to be a solid self is maybe not quite as solid as I thought. And many people don't like that realization at first. You know, maybe they only have a slight glimpse of it and they, they step back and they say, oh, it's too frightening. They're uncomfortable with it, they don't like it. It's like, I've got to let go of everything, everything I love and like, you know, my family, my partner, my friends, my money, my property, my this, my that, my country, my whatever. Whatever it is you normally identify with. It seems like letting go of self is letting go of all these good, useful things. But it's not that at all. You're understanding the process by which the mind, under the influence of craving and clinging, creates suffering for itself by attaching to a self that is not there. It's not real. It's just an ap appearance of things. And it's not the real self, not the real truth. 
So you have to be patient with even that when you have a bit of insight. Maybe the mind goes very quiet and things you normally, the normal thinking mind, the normal clinging of the mind disappears for a while. You know, the mind, you, you, you could have an immediate reaction of, I don't like this, I'm not comfortable with this. Where's that familiar territory of the self gone? You know, my normal reactions, my more normal thinking and feeling and emotions, where's it all gone? You know, some people even say they don't mind having a bit of fear and worry and anger because it, you know, it makes them feel real. <laughs> but if you have some glimpse into the still, quiet mind, you, know, you might realize that well, that reality is not such a good place. It's not such a good reality. It's like, you know, you'd say, oh, I want a beach. Uh, I'll even accept a polluted beach with full of rubbish, better than no beach. But actually, you know, no self is it's much better than a polluted self, yeah, better than a polluted beach. <laughs> it's just you have to get familiar with it, practice get to know it and realize until you quite naturally will realize, oh, it's much better to let go of this delusion of self. Get to the mind that is not craving and clinging, oh, that's much better. And if you've tasted it a few times, or you're, you'll get encouraged to keep practicing. You'll realize, oh, this is good. I want this more. And that wanting is not coming from craving anymore, it's just a natural Ev evolution of the mind that sees it's better to be in a place where you're not clinging to things with a sense of self, craving. It's better to be a place of just being aware, knowing the way things are, seeing the way things are impermanent, unsatisfactory, not self. It's better to have that realization, that understanding in the mind. So we have to keep reminding ourselves why we practice, how to practice, keep coming back to a, giving ourselves the correct teaching, the information, not rushing out to tell the rest of the world so quickly, but maybe working on ourselves a bit more. And we'll get deeper into the practice, we'll get more benefit from it. Anyway, for today, uh, <laughs> I have told you about the practice, so uh, I'll leave it there for your contemplation. <laughs> yes.